So the aim for today, as it says, is just to describe the different... It's got this term video over IP, but really what does that mean? Because there are currently a number of different approaches to solving that problem. Um, and I'll just try and give you a bit of an overview of what they are and then how they differ and how maybe they're the same. Um, and you might say the strap line to this is from our point of view, and how does that affect the products we do? Are they the same? Are they different? So I start, I think you will know SDI, but at its fundamental level, it's taking video from a camera and gets it to the monitor. Likewise, audio and the PC here is me just writing and all the other data stuff. I've collected that all together just to make this a bit easier. But what SDI does, as you know this, is that it takes a video, puts it into a particular thing that we call a frame, it then takes the audio, puts that in the Hank and the Vank area, and then sends that out down a wire as a sequence of samples, as represented here by little dots. That's all it does. What's great about that, it's a great standard. What's not so great about that is that either end has to do all this formatting to get it into a standardised format and choose where to put the audio in, choose where to put the data in. The audio is formatted not in its native format, it has to do some translation, has to do packetised. When I say packetised, it does format changes, puts it into that format, sends it to sequence <coughs> samples, and then this end does the exact same opposite to get it back actually into the raw video that we started off with right over here. So that's what we currently do. It's great. It works. We're all completely happy with that. SDI over IP. This is probably the one that most people would have heard of. So EG Simply 2022. Um, there are other versions of this, but for the sake of it, what that does is, as the name implies, keeps it the SDI concept in there. So this block is doing the exact same job as before. It takes the video, puts it into the bottom right hand bit, it takes the audio, puts it in the Hank and Bank, and puts the data. It then logically sends it out as a sequence of samples into another block that looks at that frame and divides it up into equal size network packets. Add some header, which you need to get it across the network, and sends those packets in sequence over the network. Then at the other end, you're then doing the reverse to get it back. So this will take those packets, which are now dashes, puts it out as a sequence of samples, those samples go into a block, it then knows where the video is, it knows where the audio is, it knows where the data is, and eventually gets you back to the video, the audio, and the data. Conceptually then, the network is doing the exact same job as what SDI did, but you're adding extra steps to convert from one format, samples, to another format, network packets. The other interesting thing about this picture, which is different to the one before, is there's now this little cloud in there. Not to be confused with cloud out onto the big bad internet, but what that really means is that these network packets go into the network infrastructure and actually we don't care how that traffic gets to the other end. That's very different to SDI where you have this wire that you know that where that wire goes and you spend all your time routing the wire. It also means that with SDI you don't really configure either end to start talking and start listening. It's, they're always talking, but this end is always sending. By plugging the wire into this end, it starts receiving. In network land, that's not really quite the same. 
conceptually it's absolutely identical. But the difference there is you have to tell this guy to start sending and where to. This guy you have to tell to start listening and where from. That all of a sudden seems a very difficult problem to have. But as an example, when you're at home and you want to watch um, a film on YouTube or an iPlayer, you, the server that's sending that video doesn't know about you. Yet all you do is you say, please, I want to listen to that, I want to watch that video. And the there are protocols in place already that enable the person that wants to receive to ask the person that has the data to start sending it to him. So it's an area that does need to have standards involved, but it's a problem that's already been solved. The difficulty, interesting bit, is choosing which one of the many standards to use. Um, but from our point of view, I just take it as red, it's all done, it's nice and easy. <laughs> um, yeah, so this just represents the packet. That's what I say for that one. The next one, thank you. Another term that you may have come across is where people talk about transport stream. An example of that is MPEG2 transport stream. That is very similar in um, concept to the previous slide where we have one pipe. The difference here though is that it's not based on SDI at all. What happens there is that the video, as it comes in, gets divided up into very small little chunks. Those chunks are put together to make up one packet. Now I've shown here that there's a video, there's an audio, and there's data, but it could be a packet of only video, or only of audio, or any other mix. So the job here is simply it takes that raw information, puts a very small little header on it, generally doesn't translate that data, puts it into a packet, sends it across, and then right before this end is the reverse. The advantage of this scheme over the previous slide is that we haven't had to go through an intermediate stage called an SDI frame. So although we've divided up into lots of little small chunks, the workload at this end is actually not quite as much because SDI a, is designed to go into samples. This takes <coughs> that as raw, puts a header on it and sends it across. I still got everybody. <laughs> if this is too high or too low, just shout and I will adjust accordingly. Um, so, let's transport stream. The other term is essence streams. This is very similar to the transport stream approach, except that there, as you can see, the video comes in. This time, though, Packets that go out only contain video and they flow through the network and come out at the other end. The audio, likewise, has its own packet, contains only audio traffic, flows across the network, and likewise the data. Inside these headers, because they're now separate, we can use timestamps to allow us to associate the data together in time. The advantage of this scheme over the previous scheme is that now we don't have the job of having to take multiple inputs, put, pack them all together into a packet, and then at the other end, deconstruct all of that to spread it back out again. We're actually using the network now to, to do that spreading for us. This, though, looks more complicated because we've now got three logical paths, whereas the previous one only <coughs> had one. To counter that, handling multiple of anything is generally computers and software are very good at dealing with that. So having lots of things 
at this logical level really doesn't matter. Unlike, say, going back to the SDI example, where if this became separate cables, all of a sudden that is then an issue. But on here, this is all the same network traffic travelling down the same cable. Okay, for that. So, that's very quick, very high level, the different approaches. So we've got SDI, we all know, formats to a frame, sends it as samples, goes to the other end. We've got SDI over IP, which does all of that work, divides it up into packets, sends those packets across the network, those packets get reconstructed to the frame, and the frame then as samples get sent, re deconstructed back into the, the feeds. Transport stream is trying to miss out that SDI frame stage. It purely takes the video, the audio, and the data, divides it up into nice small bite-sized chunks, and that allows it to pack multiple small chunks into network packets for efficiency to get it across the network. The essence stream then says, well, let's save the job of packing them, these bite-sized chunks into network packets. What I will do, there's enough data here that I will just only use network packets of only one content type and send that across the network. And so they kind of work in what kind of apparently they've changed their name for what this is called now, so I've been told today. Um, so how does that affect the type of products that we develop and that we're used to? So I have here a example audio product. Let's think of it. It could be a audio delay product, or it could be a product that automatically, sorry, in real time translates natural speech from, let's say, English to French. The way that we would currently develop and design those products is that we would have the SDI frames coming in, this product would then deconstruct that frame, extract the audio that it needs, do, let's say, audio delay or speech translation or whatever, then reconstruct it all, put it back into a frame, send it on its merry way, and the person at the other end wouldn't have known that that one existed, was in, in the pipeline, and then it would reconstruct it. And that's the way the products work at the moment. What's great about that is that either end doesn't actually know about the person in the middle, so you can put these <coughs> in the frame, the downside is, though, that if I'm developing an audio-based product, let's say I've invented this brilliant real-time speech um, translation, I've now got to learn all about how to process video. Yet I've actually, I'm an expert in audio. I don't care about video. So it's forcing every manufacturer to be experts in every other field. The other issue is that we've got this brilliant audio product, it translates the speech, it's perfect. And I'm going to say we had it five, ten years ago. <coughs> and at that time, SD was the standard of choice. And the product worked perfectly. And then, for video reasons, we wanted to update to HD. My audio product now doesn't work because it can't accept HD on the input. We're on the brink of that same problem happening again. I could develop an audio product today, and it works brilliantly <coughs> in HD. And then new HD comes out, and all of a sudden, that product no longer works. So that means everybody has to, be, has to handle the fact that the video standards keep changing keep changing, they don't change that often, but when they do change, it affects somebody who's nothing to do with video. This scheme is applicable to SDI as it is now, 
SDI over IP, because again, these dossier dashes, the network carries all the traffic. It's also applicable to the transport stream method for the exact same reasons that this one logical path, stream of packets, contains everything. If we now flip to the next slide, let's imagine a world where we've got the exact same product, but this time we've got an essence-based network protocol. Immediately you can see that I've now invented an audio product where I only actually deal with the audio. Audio traffic is actually very low in terms of bandwidth. So that gives the product designers much more flexibility over, for example, what hardware to pick. You could envisage implementing this on a PC. Having all the video coming in, that's a much harder task. And all of the, the bad things that I was saying before are going to clearly come up as good things on this. So, for example, the move from SD to HD to 4K completely doesn't affect the audio product because it never sees that traffic. So although it may still be on the network, it completely bypasses it. And I think that to me, in a very quick summary, is why people, you hear a lot of people talk about essence-based um, network protocols, and it is very different to the way SDI works. But from a sort of product developer's point of view, and a sort of, I might say a techie point of view, this is much kinder, and that's why people like the idea of this. Downside is, it's not the way SDI is. So not only is that that step from SDI to networking, is actually you're now breaking up all those different things that go into SDI into separate parts. And that seems somehow more confusing, more complicated, because we're taking one thing, video and SDI, and splitting it into three. But from a network software processing point of view, it actually makes things simpler. Which is counterintuitive when you see a diagram like this and compare it to the previous diagram where there's only one line. But this is easier. Um, so, not quite sure how much detail people really want to go into any of this. Well, I was going to try and give a very quick overview and say, please, any questions? Yes. Yeah, I've got a, a solid question. I mean, I can see that, that would be really cool. That wrote really well in the production um, uh, chain, uh, but might be sorry about my voice. Might be lead to confusion and uh, and difficulties, say, in the contribution chain. Um, is 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 there um, some kind of wrapper? Is there some kind of technical quality enabler that uh, would allow you to have the three different streams, uh, but at the same time assure yourself? that the video and the audio are both there and both in sync with each other. Yeah, so what happens is if we go back to probably the essence. Um, thank you. The, the various protocols, and there's different ones that different people talk about, but generally the way they all work is that this black not meant to represent header, I think of it's just overhead. But what that contains is a timestamp so that allows you to synchronise that if that's time stamped at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, 12 o'clock in the afternoon, 12 o'clock in the afternoon, when they finally arrive at this end, you can get those packets and then say, oh, actually, I've got the 12 o'clock video, I've got the 11.59 audio, oh, actually, that should have already gone, I'll wait for the 12 o'clock um, audio. And if it's currently before 12 o'clock, then that's great. And obviously if it's after 12 o'clock, then you've got to decide what to throw away and how to handle that. But in reality, that's no different to any sort of system where you're, the data's coming in. Is it too early? Is it too late? It's Is very, it on time? It's a very IP-managed system. Yes. It's very IP, yeah. Yeah. And these say they're all time stamped. Now, that brings you to the next issue. How do you then ensure that they all have the same concept of time. 
But again, there's protocols to deal with that. And you know, there's one called P2P, it allows you to send time around to the nanosecond resolution and simply have a stand, say stand, they have a profile that says, use this protocol that already exists, but use it this way, and that gives us what we want. And it means you're not inventing a new protocol. These exist, they have existed for, I don't know how old that, that protocol is, but I'm, I'm slightly guessing about 10 years plus, maybe. How long is how old the BTP? Oh, um, I don't know actually. I, don't, I do know that seventy has been talking about it for six and a half years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's been around a long time. Twenty years. Twenty years. Twenty years. Twenty eighty-eight. Yeah. 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 I would probably use. I'd say about twenty years ago. So it's what actually what holds together the cellular radio system. Yeah. So it's it, usually used by telcos to hold their network synchronously. Um, so cell phones tend to work. Um, don't fall apart, um, therefore it must work. And it also is the basis of AS67, um, uh, which is the audio version that we'll be talking about. It's using factories as well to time up robots, so they yes. don't bang into each other. Yeah. Yeah. It was actually a micro, in a micro, uh, well, in a, well the, the sort of, I suppose, sort of 100 microseconds or whatever that um, the ATP would get you, they can actually damage each other quite well. Wiki says 2002. Oh, <laughs> 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 Just a point of yeah. information. Um, uh, I agree with you about, about uh, embedded audio from SD to HD, but actually the way UHD is mapped, is mapped into mm. parallel HD signals, one of which is defined as carrying audio. So actually, the way you extract and embed audio will work just fine with you. Yes, if you, do, you can handle the HD side of it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, otherwise, <laughs> you could one. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so, is there any other? Or is it just perfectly going to work? <laughs> um, yeah, it's funny because, I mean, that, from my point of view, I don't come from a video background, I come from networking and real, kind of real time control. And to me, it's networks, this, this is obvious. Why would you not do that? And whereas SDI is very bizarre. You know, this, this funny way that they put the, floor, the picture down in the bottom right of the floor, and you have Hank and Bank, and it's just really weird. Um, so what it does mean is that... Sounds from cathode ray tubes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's also interesting when you read the standard, because again, you read the standard, and it's very electrical, it's not a network protocol standard. It's electrical engineering standard. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Whereas all of this is what I'm used to every day. You know, it's network protocols, it's bits and bytes, it's headers. And that's why I didn't really want to get into the details, because the details of what goes <coughs> on here is largely irrelevant. It's mostly a case of choosing. These protocols exist, um, and you just say, oh, I'm going to use that one. Or more precisely, as an industry, we all decide to use that one. And once we agree to use that one, developers like me and the other companies go away and implement it. It's not difficult. It seems difficult, especially, as I say, going back to these diagrams, this somehow seems more complicated than this. <coughs> and I look at it and I think, great, that's really easy. And I look at the SDI one and think it's really hard. Yes. It's not the biggest challenge of all this, actually, the control and auto-discovery and things like that. Yes, <coughs> absolutely. And that's why the, that really needs good standards. The, doing this, as I say, why do I rattle through this so quick? Because it is really easy. But a lot of people seem to get hung up on the bandwidth, network, unreliability, these horrible words that keep coming up. Mm. And you're absolutely right, the big issue is as I alluded to before, unlike a wire, where you plug a wire in A, plug it in B, it will work. In networking, you have to do more than that. And you need protocols. But again, those protocols do exist. The trouble is, there's hundreds of them. And you need to choose. And that's why groups like um, why VSF simply are trying to all say to themselves, OK, let's pick those protocols. What are we trying to do, do and choose and implement? 
and I look at it from a developer's point of view and saying, great, whatever they choose, I'll go and document. They're all, at some level, doing the same thing. They're saying to this guy, please, can you send now to somebody else? It could be, I want you to send to this guy, or I want you to send to many people. That's so what you might have a multicast, which is just a way of saying, I'm going to talk like I am now, I'm talking to many people. And at the network level, it uses not much bandwidth. But very few people in the rest of the IDM IP world use multicast, do they? If the network switch, you don't support it. Um, if you try and if you try and watch your sky box via via a Wi-Fi, it doesn't work, it doesn't support multicast. But I mean it is it's, it is it is a, a bit of a a bit of a novelty really. I mean, it, it's something that we have to embrace because we need single source to go to multiple things. But it is yeah, we, 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 we are gonna have to do a bit of world leading. Well, I, I came from a pre so I came from a previous industry. I came from entertainment and lighting, right. and they had a very similar problem, where if they've got control desks, you've got lots of lights, there's lots of data, and this was back in the day where network speeds weren't as high. And there was yes, we must use multicast, and you're right, that has problems because you've got to subscribe to, you've got to have routers for right. it. And then somebody sat down and said, well, why don't I just send it individually to all the multiple people? And actually, that was as efficient. In fact, it's more efficient because network switches are brilliant at sending traffic. You go through the network path. So there, the bandwidths weren't quite as monstrous as what they think they are here. But actually, it was overall faster. So, right, well, it, I, I, it's, I, I, it's I agree an interesting you, actually, one where we yeah. really need multicast. Well, yeah, it's, you might be right, but, it, but it's, it's, the, it's you know, one, of the, one of the pillars, isn't it? Multicast going to work. I mean, for example, latency through a switch. Does it if you send it a packet? Does it send it to all four ports you direct to at the same time, or is it going to mini 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 mini? In which case, they all turn up at a different time. So, do you, yeah. so do you think that something like SDN is necessary, or is that leading the industry in the wrong way? Um, well, I I view sort of SDN as the sort of the configuration of the network, and it allows you to have central control and ideally dumber, cheaper network infrastructure. So in many ways I actually view that as a as a separate a separate issue. You you can you can view it either way really. I, I view the, I view this I want to view this cloud as exactly that, a blue cloud that I actually don't know what goes inside it. All I want to know is I want to get traffic from A to B. The people that manage that cloud are experts in network management and they optimise to the given constraints that we've given them, i.e. this link is a, let's say it's a free gigabit link and it must have less than so many milliseconds of latency or jitter or whatever, and they will configure the network to achieve that. If we start overlaying onto them what are, let's say, video-centric constraints, it's made their job harder. So I, in my head, I try to keep the two separate. Um, How do the latency <coughs> compare between these different uh, methods? I mean, including everything, all, all negotiations and everything. Yeah. I've not done any real-world testing to be able to answer that directly. I just take, you might say, the, the simplistic view where I say so that box is doing an awful lot less the SDI box going SDI to IP or even the transport stream box. So, no, I can't quote you numbers. I sort of view it as more as the, that's relatively straightforward to implement. You could see how you can optimise it. The other ones are, it can be done, but it's a slightly harder chance. Whether slightly harder translates to extra time I think will come down to the quality of the implementation. Can you make it so that the latency is fixed? It's always the same amount. You could if you've got control over this. Yeah. That then is a job for these guys. Yeah. You say, I need this latency. And they can engineer a network to achieve the latency you require. Yeah. There are techniques to do that. One is you simply over provision. You put a lot more capability in here so you don't get conflicts. 
And the other way is that you have, if you, this becomes a little bit more than just a single blob, it actually becomes lots of different switches and things. You can get to some areas where there are different paths that get you from your A and your B. And there are protocols that manage the optimal, efficient way of doing that. Some of them, you can actually pre-configure the network to say, this tra traffic will always go there. And so at the network level, you can say, well, OK, I'll make sure that path will always have enough, more than enough bandwidth to what I need. A standard office network, you don't worry about that. Pretty much, you put all your traffic in, and it might get blocked, or it might not, but it will eventually get there. In this land, where you absolutely need to, um, you need to deterministically prove that the traffic will get there, just means you engineer your network with those constraints. And engineer, network engineers, that's what they get paid for, and that's what they do. That's, that's, that's nothing, okay. It's nothing new. It's, they were, if they were in, in a data center, they'd have people given exactly the same requirements. You know, I've got this server that needs to talk to that hard disk. I'm just a bit old fashioned. But this server, this, this um, storage system, it needs a latency of X or it needs a bandwidth of Y. And it's exactly the same. So that's not, it's not, it's a, not a totally precise way of answering your question, but it's a it's there. But don't you end up in, in order to ensure the latency is always deterministic, having a buffer probably bigger than you'd really like and therefore getting more latency than you'd really like? Um, Can I part on to that? I would what say no. <laughs> what, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, what, what is the, if you take an SDI equipment at the moment, every single bit of SDI complex equipment has roughly at least a line's worth of buffering in it. Therefore, whatever goes upstream of that can be wobbling all over the place, and it still works. Um, so, does it really? Does it really matter? For a commodity MPLS network from a major telco, uh, anywhere in the UK to anywhere else, the maximum delay is about 48 milliseconds. Mm. Um, and that's from sort of beyond John O'Groats to beyond Land's End. Therefore, if it's in a more sort of mainland area, that's under a frame. And for a contribution link, you've nearly always got a frame buffer on, 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 on your input. So a lot of this Yes, there are buffers. There are buffers at the moment. This IP stuff just adds a few more, but they're usually smaller than the size of buffers that we normally uh, normally work with. Um, and yes, um, uh, I know that all of us have been uh, noting the, uh, the differences to BBC's FM distribution, We're having moved to, uh, to, 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 to an IP basis. Um, but um, uh, which has made a, a bit of delay in it, but but um, that's an, a sort of audio type delay, a few <coughs> tens of some hundreds of samples, uh, rather than what we tend to look at it in terms of ten, twenties, thirties, forties of microseconds. Well, just just an observation, really, because I mean, latency is just one of the things you have to learn to live with. Uh, it's it, it's somehow not. We're not even a, a, a topic for argument uh, because it's something that's inherently there because that latency is around because you're choosing to use a network which isn't solely yours and which, which as you say, you don't want to know what goes on inside the blue cloud. <coughs> what's going on in the blue cloud is there's loads of other traffic um, coming from other people. Um, so the, mm, no, you know, no. to an extent, if, yeah, if you, oh, if you have a service level of agreement, you can have some idea, but I don't think you can ever be totally certain about what that latency is going to be. But as, as I say, on the whole, with current equipment, what the latency actually is doesn't matter because you don't know it, what it is at the moment. Yeah. Because everything has got a buffer on the input. For God only knows why. I'm of an age where I can remember trimming cables to sub nanosecond uh, uh, lengths to, to get it all, 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 all working right. Um, but for some reason, it's a lot easier to plug SDI together if, it, uh, if the input of the vision mixer has a, a line or two of buffering on it. Um, it, it sort of works 
without anybody having to do very much. So you've got that at the moment. And whatever you're likely to do with an IP network, which might have jitter and, uh, and latency variations, and you can enter into interesting debates about what that actually means, and then compare it to the timing tolerance on SDI, um, a lot of it is we've already got it there, but we just <coughs> don't, we, we sort, of, sort of don't understand that it's there, therefore it doesn't actually really matter. I think if, if we go and, and, uh, and if you've got stuff like PTP, <laughs> so you, 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 you're accurately uh, timing what you've got, and you sort it out the far end, you know, it doesn't really matter. If you take your signal into an alter viewer, you lose a frame. Yes. If you take it to a monitor, you probably lose at least one, if not three frames. Yes. So, yeah. while you might think you have no latency, you have. Yes. Thanks, so, David. Yes. Well, Mark. I, I would argue that since we don't have any, any devices that produce negative time, mm -hmm. um, fighting every place where you get more latency and accepting your points about multi-viewers and, and other devices and systems, mm -hmm. uh, the, the art is to try and reduce the accumulation to the point at which, well, so that you don't end up with systems which are then unusable in a live scenario. <coughs> Ironically, you can do negative time in this new world. Yes. <laughs> it makes your head hurt, but you can do negative time. The other thing is I'll say is that, again, from my sort of pure engineering point of view, what is, what is latency? It's basically part of it is every time you go through a piece of equipment, that piece of equipment has to do something with that data on the way as it comes in, does something with it, and sends it back out again. This is an awful lot less work yeah. than what we yeah. currently do on SDI. So even if this was worse, which I don't think it would be, we're gaining already by this. That, you know, the important thing is, that's a solid red line. That stayed there. We've not had to translate, we've not had to process, we've not had to put it on funny lines, we've not had to uh, <coughs> essentially waste lines. And going back to that original one bright word on the S. You know, the young frame one. Yes, I guess we exaggerated there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sending video, I'm sending all this other stuff around it. That actually is adding latency. It's, it's, it's samples on the wire that adds yeah. no value. If it came from a camera, let's say it was only camera to a, a video, I've added latency because of the way the protocol works. It's not adding latency, it's, a, it's wasting bandwidth, mm. which is subtly different. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'd say it's adding latency as well because you're having to process it. You could have got your first pixel through yeah. a Yeah. 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 Well, I, I think you could say. The time you yeah. 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 Would be the argument. Yeah. If you go, go back to that slide you were on showing the cloud yeah. for the audio example. Yes. Um, audio example. Oh, yeah. The next one I want to say where's the audio. Nope. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> where's the audio example? That one? Well, no, no. Yeah, that'll that that do. Yeah, that'll do. But I mean, a lot depends on. Just what you mean by that cloud, it could be anything from a tightly managed switch on a very private, highly localized network. It could be the whole internet, in which case some of your packets might be going via Kansas and the next one goes via Tokyo. Yes. And they've all got to be stitched back together again. And there's going to be an enormous difference in, in the characteristics of those two setups, depending on what your definition is of that cloud in the middle of your diagram. Yes, yes. and the way that comes back to exactly that, you're defining what the characteristics you require. If it is you require one millisecond of the maximum latency and 100 megabits of bandwidth, well that's the requirement of that network provider. Mm. Now that network engineer will take those requirements and deliver, or not, <laughs> and, then, and then negotiations ensue. But the big bad internet what is the big bad internet? Actually, it's a whole sequence of different networking companies that have relationships with each other. Because there is no internet as such. There are companies that provide network services that link to each other. You pay them money, they will give you the service you need. It's as simple as that. It's money. It's, there isn't this sort of... Sort of internet backplane that you all then share in some sort of amical way. Mm -hmm. Money will talk and you can spend money. But you may not like the money. But that managed 
highly managed cloud that you've ordered and specified, uh, you might have to give the network provider three months' notice. Should that be added to the latency? <laughs> Not if you come up with enough money. Yeah. 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 But it's what your service, or you know, if it's inside the facility, of course, then that would be your own people. In the same way, you've got your own people dealing with an SDI network. I want to have a new camera in the studio, a new monitor over there. Can the electrician come out and lay a new cable? Sorry, it's doing something else the next three months. So I think that's that's awesome. so we've, we've been playing where we get lots of IP lib live libs. That's most of our third party base now are all pretty much IP. And I think. The, the more control you have of the network and the more managed the network is, then this is great. This is great for internally within a facility to be able to bring a signal in and take off essences, put through, you know, get rid of what you need Dolby anymore, but you know, put, put through converters, do all those other elements, manipulate certain things, multiple languages, all that kind of thing. But for outside of your control, where you don't have a huge amount of control, so like the contribution links coming in, it's quite nice to have it all wrapped up so that you, cause you, you, so you don't lose as many packets and you can deal with that and then sort of unwrap it as it comes in into the building and then when you've got control over it. So we, you know, for unmanaged networks you know, that you, from third parties that are coming from someone's turned up on site to plug into a box that's finding a route across the network, yeah. it's nicer to have it bundled. Yes, I mean, cause it, I mean that's why MPEG-2 TS still exists. You know, because it, it, it has this, in some ways, less efficient because his packet is the little chunks are very small, so you have to do a lot more work. But it has the advantage, exactly that, that you, the data tends to stay together because it's got the timestamps involved. So actually, and and in some, my view, it's great. You have all of them. The thing I suppose, from my point of view, is the thing I really don't like is the ones that are based on SDI. That just seems to be really bizarre. This has got a very good case for it, and so does the transport stream. I think you're right. Transport stream externally makes a lot of sense. Um, it seems odd sending blanking panels, or blank, blanking signals, and everything through making them an IP, whereas you, know, you don't actually need that because mm -hmm. modern world. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. worth looking at where these protocols <coughs> came from. So, <laughs> it's 2022 dash 2 came from moving TS around over IP, which is brilliant. And it's just low bandwidth. If you can afford low bandwidth, then you're in. If you've got high bandwidth, 70, 20, 20 days. 2-6 gets you synchronised audio and video in a package for free. Yeah. And be there for you If you're in your facility, then the AMWAR and NMI does an amazing job for you with incredibly low latency. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there is no magic wand that we can apply at this point that says this is the answer. That would be a lie to everybody. What you have to do is gauge what you need, where you need it, and what you can afford. Or indeed, the same as it's always been, I suspect. If we're honest about it. Yeah. Nobody ever talks about AVB anymore. Amazing <laughs> 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 that. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Did anyone ever make a switch for it? Oh, yeah. Axon, Axon. 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 They are trying to do is a, is a layer below IP. All of these protocols I've described are talking IP, which, broadly speaking, IP is one of the protocol protocol rules. And anything below that, IP doesn't care about. So having an Ethernet, a different type of Ethernet, which is maybe a simplistic saying this, AVB was part of that. I had the same thing in my in our previous industry. Mm -hmm. People were really worried about latency and jitter. And I said, the only way of doing that is control, control at the Ethernet level. And no. <laughs> Just forget about that sort of stuff.